Stanford University. <laughs> Entrepreneur and Thought Leader Seminar Series brought to you by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and uh, BASIS, the Business Association for Stanford Engineering Students. This talk is archived uh, for future viewing by our friends at SCPD and it's generously underwritten by Draper, Fisher, and... <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, how many of you have heard of Steve Jervison before? Oh, good. Well, the rest of you get to know him this afternoon. He's really a tour de force. I'm not going to tell you about him other than that he was a co-term here. That was smart. And then he enjoyed uh, coming to Stanford so much that he came back and got an MBA here as well. So he's, uh, he's been a student on all parts of the campus uh, back in the 80s and 90s. But he's been a partner at Draper Fisher and Jervison for quite a while and uh, is a returnee to this seminar series. So we're happy to have him back. But what's really uh, nice to announce is that there's his dad, Tony. <laughs> so wait, let's give his dad a round of applause. <laughs> thanks, thanks for being the parent of one of our speakers. <laughs> thanks, all right. So without further ado, give a warm welcome back to campus to Steve Jurgensen. Thank you, Tom. That's great. Thanks. Um, wow, this is overwhelming. I can't tell you uh, how much of a surprise it is to see folks uh, piled in the aisles and along the back, and I apologize if it's uncomfortable. I'll try to speak quickly to leave time for questions and to shift your weight around, and maybe uh, we can even shift some people into different chairs or something over time, because I feel bad about having to stand for an hour. So what I've been uh, sort of hoping to talk about with you and share some thoughts is our perspective as a venture capital firm um, and as a practitioner of that art. Um, of what we're seeing in the entrepreneurial community. Because frankly, the thing I love most about my job is the daily meetings we have with entrepreneurs who are bold and brash and set out to change the world in some meaningful way. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but we get the joy of learning from them. And in some ways, my job as a speaker is to integrate the best of what I've learned from them and some of the patterns we're seeing in technology trends and such uh, in the industry. I'll try to just speak for maybe half the time and leave the other half for questions if I can, because inevitably uh, you're gonna be interested in something that uh, I didn't pre-anticipate. Uh, pre it is good to be back on campus. I have done three degrees here, and uh, I remember a course very much like this vividly uh, during my undergrad days, um, where they brought in parades of entrepreneurs and, and folks from community, and it really helped connect with Silicon Valley, and it's something I remember vividly, and so I'm glad to be part of that again today. So what I want to talk a little bit about is disruptive innovation. Um, this is what startups do. It's different from other kinds of innovation, sustaining innovation, if you've subscribed to Clayton Christensen's view of life, and technology accelerating change. In other words, the pace of change that's being induced by technology and why that's particularly important and synergistic with what we do and with what entrepreneurs do. And then give some examples. I couldn't possibly cover them all. As an adventure firm, we invest in a wide variety of industries and sectors. Some of the ones that interest us the most don't even have categories yet. They don't fit in a bucket. They don't fit in a category. Um, they're unique ideas of one sort or another, but I'll give one example that may be of some interest to anyone interested in information theory or life sciences, and that's the integration of the two, um, the re-engineering of the information systems of biology as one of these frontiers of the unknown, one of these exciting areas of future progress that I think um, warrants a lot of attention, certainly is getting a lot of it on campus in the engineering uh, sectors, and one that excites us and myself. So just one slide on us for background. Um, we're unusual in a couple ways. We're a very early stage focused venture fund, although there are several that do that. But more unusual is this uh, federated network of funds we've built around the world. Most recently announced today in Russia and uh, a couple weeks ago, a big uh, expansion of our European operations. We're trying to build a network of venture funds across the planet that are cross-linked by equity ownership, but not managed centrally. And so we can hopefully benefit from some of the Rolodex network benefits of you know, partner introductions, resumes, deal flow, information about markets and such, yet not try to bog down with one big organization that's uh, managing uh, many offices. So that's an experiment and process we've been doing for about 15 years in, uh, in this expansion mode and I uh, think we can scale the venture business in a way that can tap into entrepreneurs around the world in Silicon Valley. I think I heard the audio cut in and out. Was that sounding okay for you still? Okay. 
enough on us. Oh, maybe I'll just mention in, in aggregate we have um, about six billion dollars under management, but it's all in small pockets that are investing in startups. So there's no one fund that's a billion dollars, for example. So topics. There are a lot of things, a lot of change in the world. You see it in the news reflected in uh, market share shifts of companies, shorter lifespans of companies, uh, shorter lifespans of countries, and um, initiatives of technologies and products. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, one of the fundamental drivers is technology and disruptive technology in general. And, and it's all uh, very synergistic with what entrepreneurs do day in and day out. So one of the main points I want to try to make today is that this pace of change is only accelerating, and that entrepreneurs are the main drivers of it in that they are fundamentally themselves changing through a sort of mutually synergistic benefit of both globalization and network effects that feed each other over the internet. So, why is this important? It, I'm guessing it's of interest to anyone who um, sort of is close to technology or technology business in their interests or uh, futures, but it also impacts you know, the fate of nations, you know, the way Singapore is going versus its neighbor Malaysia can largely be traced to themes as to how one taps into um, advances in uh, the language of the digital era and now the genomics era. The entire um, fate of nations and context for our lives um, is going to change dr dramatically and has quite a bit so far. For what we do in our business, of course, it's very important. That's why we pay attention to it. But I think al also, just no matter who you are, it's a fundamental cause for optimism. I think when you dwell on the pace of technology change, it really cheers you up. So what do VCs look for? Just one quick slide. It's probably obvious, but this is the way we like to frame it. Almost every VC will tell you the first point. Passionate entrepreneurs, of course. That's what you have to look for. This one's somewhat unique to us. In other words, I don't know if other venture firms emphasize the second bullet point as much as we do. We really try to find unique ideas, not sure money makers, not yet another great idea that fits in a framework of investment theses that we just roll out over and over again. We're really trying to make every one of our investments one of a kind. And that gives you a lot of ancillary benefits like diversification and things of that sort. And of course, they have to have a, both a desire and a plausible plan to change the world. Something bold, um, something brash, not just a, you know arbitrage-seeking opportunist uh, looking to make a quick buck. A lot of these other things you hear about from venture capitalists are, I think, derivative from these core points. Um, and much of our strategy and tactics as a firm derive from this one simple rule, um, from a Kathy Eisenhart sense of simple rules that, uh, from which all strategy derives. But one of the things we really look for is disruptive technology. So let me uh, focus on that. Why is that? So I might ask a question to you. Why does a startup exist and why do venture firms exist? Right? They, they are going up against daunting challenges, right? Undercapitalized, no brand. You know, no market presence, no prior customer relationships. You know, a startup company has everything stacked against them, except for one thing. Usually there's something relating to disruption. If it weren't for this, a startup wouldn't win. If you had stasis, stability, and predictability in any given market, you don't tend to see startups. And so it's sort of an obvious point, but one that we like to focus on, that if you don't have something disrupting the marketplace, it's just going to be the big guys getting bigger. Right? And so what are those, so here's some examples of ones that we think of, but most of these we can't really invest in in any given on sort of ongoing strategy, like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I couldn't count on most of these. Like structural changes in markets, deregulation, privatization, right? These are great opportunities when they come in certain economies around the world, but you can't count on the next one 20 years from now. You know, I, I couldn't predict what it might be. Even financial turmoil itself is a form of disruption. It's kind of funny, but some of the companies in our portfolio that are doing the best are in the automotive an industry that's just, just completely disrupted through financial turmoil and all kinds of interesting uh, uh, self-induced injuries around pension plans and what have you that allows the Teslas of the world or even software companies that sell to auto dealers. They're having a booming business, right? And it's usually some form of disruption that allows the new entrant to come in. Sometimes disruption can come from new channels of distribution. If you think of when Dell first entered competing with Compaq back when they were like resellers versus direct to consumer kinds of uh, channels that were forming for, um, for selling computers, it was almost as if Compaq's fate was written on the wall and sure enough, Dell took the business and the franchise away from Compaq in those early days because of their ab ability to exploit a new channel distribution. And if it weren't for that, you know, just being yet another computer manufacturer didn't make the difference. And all the other competitors of Compaq that were classic in the same business through the same channels didn't really have as uh, good a chance. The internet's a classic example of new channel distribution, the most, uh, sort of the largest disruption in how you reach customers. And by channel, I just mean what is the method by which a company reaches its customers? Uh, through what intermediary, through what sales channel? The internet's the biggest change in that that we've seen. I'm not sure what the next one is, probably something to do with mobility. Predict what the one after that would be. So again, it's great when you find them, but hard to predict a sustainable business. Why will entrepreneurs be around 50 years from now? Why will they be around 100 years from now? I'm not sure which of those I would count on. This one I will count on. Every year, every decade, every century, disruptive technology advances continue, and they compound, and they become more and more powerful. So this is the one that really gets us excited. It may have been in the noise, but it kind of answers the question, why do VCs focus on technology? 
you know, why are they doing so few retail deals or so many other parts of the economy that are, you know, service economy is a bigger part um, of the economy than the goods or physical products. And, you know, why are we in these weird niches and why does it seem so natural to us to do that and so unnatural to invest in other areas? It's because this is where we, we find this, these disruptive um, uh, dynamo to, to, uh, gal to sort of glom onto. A lot of the advances tend to be interdisciplinary, which is great when you're at school. You can study many things and think about integrating innovations from one domain into another, where the sort of stovepipe thinking within businesses, within academic disciplines, tends to isolate the thinking. You know, if you can be one of those cross-pollinators, you usually can think of a, a disruption that hadn't been thought of before. And I might argue that most of the game-changing advances in science tend to come from left field, not from the warmth of the center of the herd, but from an unusual thinker outside of, uh, out of the box. The changes are also nonlinear. It's very hard to make business predictions using straight lines and paper when the curves are exponential. And I think that may be fundamental lack of thinking, lack of use of log paper in business to make this uh, such a predictable uh, advance for the new entrant, like Apple entering the music business and taking the Walkman franchise from Sony. I mean, you could have predicted flash memory prices and disk drive prices and seen the point when the tape drive was going to disappear. Yet, you know, the incumbents just did nothing about it. They somehow couldn't uh, see that change that would inevitably occur in their, mu in their business as it went digital. So some examples of exponential curves. It's a historical one, one of my favorites, of course, uh, going back to the internet boom. Um, but a remarkably smooth curve of growth that the internet provided um, that was sort of a pure example of network effects, what we came to call viral marketing, where you did no traditional marketing of any sort, but the product propagated open channels of humans in the way that they communicate with each other, in this case, web-based email for the first time. Grew very rapidly, acquired a nice outcome for investors, remarkably short period of time. And oh, by the way, the product was built by one person in three months, Jack Smith. Um, and caught our attention, because these are the kind of things we'd love to invest in. So we found another one, but we didn't invest in this one. It came out of Israel, ICQ. What was astounding is if you compensate for when they launched, which were six months staggered, but if you, you know, make the curves so the same, they start at the same axis point, it was the exact same pattern of growth. You know, they told two friends and so on and so on, kind of like the old shampoo commercial from, I guess it was the 80s, so you probably don't remember that. Um, in any case, it, uh, it was a remarkable sim similar pattern. It made us think about what are the formulas driving viral marketing and spread of products and buddy networks and such. Then these Motley crew came into the picture. Again, speaking of globalization, does anyone know, well, before I get to the story, let me go back. Does anyone know where Hotmail was based? Where the company was headquartered? Oh man, first right answer. Did you work there? Or have you heard me say it before? You talk. Okay. Usually someone says Bangalore or whatever. Yeah, they purposely chose Fremont because it's free email. You want to launch a company from Fremont. And they were on Liberty Avenue in Fremont. And they launched on the 4th of July. And of course, that was all a big no PR whatsoever because there were, no one was paying attention on the 4th of July. So in any case, now Estonia, you know, uh, my homeland, so I am biased. But um, a small group of people there built a product remarkably quickly that set new records for the pace of growth of a new uh, product, both Kazan and the free music space before it, which could arguably said, hey, free music you know, has been proven to grow quickly. But then Skype, a slightly more uh, serious product that uh, uh, some of you may have heard a um, speaker here recently uh, from Skype. It's, it's a remarkable story, over 400 million users and, and growing quite rapidly and recently spun out of eBay, or at least in the process of being spun out of eBay. So what's interesting about Skype is not just their sheer growth, but the fact that they built a brand in such a short period of time. There was a question asked, in this case 2005, what product has had the greatest impact on your life in the last year? And it was an open-ended response form, right? People just fill in the responses. And it's quite remarkable, you know, coming in out of nowhere as the third product behind Google and Apple. Um, again, with almost no marketing budget whatsoever, um, really caught our attention. Said something's new about the network economy, there's something new about globalization and the interplay of both. That these startups can come from anywhere and they can serve global customers day one in ways that we just couldn't do 10, 20 years ago. When I started in the business, we invested in U.S. companies, primarily California, serving U.S. customers, and we didn't worry about international customers until they're starting to get ready to go public. Around the time of filing your S1, you'd set up a joint venture in Japan and maybe one in Europe. But as a venture capitalist, that wasn't your forte. It wasn't something you were expected to be able to help companies with. But now that's completely changed. Changing it even more is one of my favorite people, Gordon Moore. Uh, at least the eponymous law that is ascribed to him. Um, uh, he likes to go salmon fishing out here in Half Moon Bay, so there's a photo I took of him. In fact, I think all the photos in here are ones I've taken, just as an aside. I love photography as a hobby. And he is a wonderful guy, and he came up with something called Moore's Law. Now, I want to ask how many people have seen Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law, which is an abstraction of Moore's Law that goes back over 100 years. Oh, come on. Are people being shot only two hands? Three? Four? Wow. This is actually one of the lowest response rates of any audience I've seen, which is... I don't understand what that means. Um, <laughs> Usually our investors, like our LPs, they don't read this kind of stuff, but anyway. Um, 
I think it's the most important graph of all technology business and all history um, of technology business. And what it's showing, just to explain, a logarithmic scale, so a straight line on this would be exponential pace of growth that's slightly upticking, Kurzweil argues is a double exponential, where you're looking not at how many transistors are on a chip, but how many calculations per second you can buy for $1,000. Because nobody buys transistors, right? Intel may care about transistor count, and more as a co-founder of Intel certainly cared about it, but people buy computation and storage. And either way you graph it, you get this remarkable curve that transcends any one technology. So the sort of colored bands are integrated circuits, discrete components, vacuum tubes, relays, mechanical devices. The dots are the sort of price performance leaders of their day. So there may be other you know, companies that fill, or products that fill the graph below it. This is the frontier of human computational capacity. It says a lot of interesting things. First, what does that mean? You know, there are deep cosmological questions and all kinds of you know, evolutionary arguments one can make about how we use our technology to build our tools and so on and so forth. And, and, and where might this head, oh, by the way, if it goes for just another 25 or 50 years and $1,000 buys you more computational power than all human brains on Earth combined? It's kind of a, a, you reach some staggering points if this continues. It also um, begs the question of what the next technology platform would be. You know, molecular electronics or nanotech or spintronics or quantum computing beyond the integrated circuit. Doesn't have to be CMOS silicon uh, as we've known it. Something new may take over. But most importantly of all, at least from a source of optimism and, and interest, is that there seems to be absolutely no coupling to the economy. Right? So these companies may have come and gone, but the Great Depression, all the recessions, World War I, World War II, have had no meaningful impact on the progress of innovation and technology. Which is astounding. If you really stop and let that sink in, because in the middle of an economic recession, you might think, oh, innovation dries up, and it doesn't, right? Within university labs, it's just booming like crazy. The companies that take advantage of that may have pent up demand and maybe more pent up disruption to take advantage of when you finally do come out um, with a new product or service. But the pace of human innovation, I believe, continues unabated and is exogenous to the economy. Pretty cool. Now, what are some reasons why people seem to have a hard time uh, taking this into their business planning? Well, here's one graph, this is historical on purpose, during the internet boom time, where if you just took, in this case, number of internet hosts or web servers out there, on a logarithmic scale, you'd see this particularly uninteresting curve, uh, the way scientists would plot it. Um, if you take the exact same set of data points, but plot it the way newspapers would report it, it looks like that. Right? And so the way they tell the story is, out of nowhere, the internet exploded on the scene here. Well, why? Uh, let's look back to what was going on here. Oh, Netscape's IPO. That must have been what it was, right, around this time period. Or when you add a few more data points and shift the knee of the curve, because there's no knee in the curve when it's plotted, you know, on this kind of paper. The knee of the curve is just an illusion based on some random choice of axes when you plot it this way. You know, time passes and then all of a sudden it's Google saying, well, it's, you know, it's us that made a difference in the pace of growth. And it's always, history is told by those who are a couple years after the inflection point of the random curve you happen to draw at the time. And when they're never the first mover, right? There's no such thing as first mover advantage in technology. It's just whoever wins says they were first and they redefine the market as such. And, and Steve Jobs was classic at that. Uh, great stories in Q&A if you want. Okay, for those of you who aren't interested in IT, realize that all these accelerating curves of change are not special to IT. So sure, they occur in all these areas uh, quite dramatically, but they also occur in life sciences in ways that are less well appreciated and not fully understood. Um, Dickerson, not well known, but he actually was more accurate in his prediction in 1965 about something fairly mundane about number of proteins that in crystalline instruction, which will be uh, deduced over time or determined over time rather. And uh, he's been accurate to I think less than a half percent uh, to the current day, which is quite remarkable. Now, what's an example that's maybe topical and relates to the information knowledge or embedded content of the entire sort of life sciences and genomics revolution? Could be the number of genes that are sequenced. It's just one proxy. It happens to be the one we have the most data on, so it's nice to plot it. Here's what it looked like leading up to the sequencing of the human genome, led by Craig Venner and then a competitive government effort as well. And you might say, well, gosh, wouldn't that be the pinnacle of accomplishment? Wouldn't we just you know, kick back for the next 10 years and digest all that information that came out of the human genome project? And oh, by the way, you know, a lot of stories were told about how, you know, 90% of the pro project was completed in the last year, which is exactly what you'd expect with these kinds of curves. So, you might say, well, where does it go next? Well, it's interesting. Here's just five more years of data, so that last curve ends here, and it just keeps going. What are these people doing? What are they sequencing? What, what is all this data that's being dumped into the public archives? And would it continue? I mean, how could, taking this to the current day, what, would you just go off the chart? And sure enough, one team, again, Craig Venner, has grown this data set tenfold in the last two years. How did he do that? Well, he realized there's microbes everywhere. It's not a big insight. And this is going to be a segue to some of the industrial biotech 2.0 stuff that we're investing in and getting kind of excited about. There's a lot of microbes out there, a ton of it in, a, in the seawater. Every time you get a little gulp of seawater, you're swallowing in every milliliter millions of bacteria and viruses. And they're incredibly diverse. 
And there's a lot of them out there. And oh, by the way, they make up the majority of the Earth's biomass. In fact, most of the cells in your body are bacterial. And if you look at unique DNA, 99% of the unique DNA in your body is bacterial. So 90% of the cells, 99% of the DNA. Um, you're kind of a, as I call it, a big bag of microbes. So what are these things? Oh, and by the way, you can't digest certain metabolites in your bloodstream, only come through bacterial channels. The human body is unable to produce them, yet they're throughout our body. There's all kinds of synergies we just barely understand of how microbes keep us alive. So what Venner did, is he did the best boondoggle ever, financed by Gordon Moore and the Department of Energy, went on a sailboat around the world, and uh, Polynesia, Fiji, you know, all these great destinations, and sampled seawater about every 200 miles, and ran it through his gene sequencing techniques. He had the insight that he thinks computational power, again, Moore's law, had reached the point, the threshold, where we don't even have to distinguish the organisms in an ecosystem. Just run the entire ecosystem through the shotgun sequencing methodology where you blast the DNA into random fragments, have the computers try to put it all back together again. Right? That's why that was his insight that let him win the human genome sequencing project. People said it couldn't be done, the computers caught up, prediction of Moore's law hit right at the right time, and boom, they could synthesize the genome on the human project. So similarly with ecosystems, just put the whole ecosystem through, don't even care where the organisms came from or what, which one came from one or another and figure out what are all the genes that exist out there. And this is how he's grown by about a hundredfold the number of known genes involved with energy transduction. So taking energy from the sun and harvesting it for various um, uses within the cell. These organisms in the ocean have evolved over longer periods of time than plant, land-based plants and animals and they're much more efficient than the photosynthesis we know of on land. Similarly, he found immense biodiversity for the ecologists in the room. He found that sometimes in the open ocean, between successive samples, the biodiversity was 85% different. It would be like tundra and, and arctic and rainforest in terms of biodiversity in the microbial populations. Now, why would you do this? Well, it turns out the pace of progress in synthesizing genes is growing faster than the pace of um, um, uh, reading them. So writing the code of life is advancing. This is, again, totally different um, and uncomparable scales. They're just the slopes you can compare. Moore's law is, is growing roughly at the same as gene sequencing or re gene reading, but gene writing is growing at a much higher slope. And the, the insight, the aha Venter had was, I don't really need to have the source organism anymore. One of the fundamental insights was, up until now in biotech, you had to cut and paste from living organisms, right? You had to take DNA from something you could find and insert it into something else. If you wanted to make more of it, you had to find the host organism from which it came. Today, you just send an email file, right? It's about there's actually about 20 different places around the world. You email the file, they FedEx you the DNA. No animals are involved. Just give me an ATG, CC, AC. You know, you just, it's just code. One of the first things synthesized was polio a few years back. Uh, part of a stunt. Viruses are small. Caught people's attention. They'd made polio from scratch in a lab. And none of the people contributing the DNA even knew it was being done, which is a little bit of a problem. Um, bacteria is much larger. Um, uh, Venture has done that this year. Um, and is about to boot up the first synthetic organism or first artificial life form where the DNA did not come from any animal. He's shown that you could take 100% of the DNA out of one organism, put it into another and change that animal, sort of alchemy if you will, and the genetic codes are as different as mice and man. Now these are microbes, single cell organisms, but nevertheless a wholesale change of phenotype from swapping out 100% of the DNA has been shown. So the idea is that uh, you'll usher in a new era of synthetic biology. The wonderful professor who recently joined Stanford, ground floor of the Y2E2 building, Drew Endy. He, before that, um, was involved with starting of iGEM, the International uh, Genetic Engineer Machines Competition, where children, teenagers, um, uh, you can call them children, so the teenagers basically compete uh, globally to build um, microbes that do interesting things, little flashing units. Uh, the first thing they did is make them smell better, you know, because the uh, E. coli smells like the place from which it comes. And so they made it smell like bananas, and, you know, that was a first step. Others used it too as an arsenic detector. Uh, the winning teams were from Peking University in Slovenia this year. And one of them was pretty cool. It created a biofilm um, that reacted to light and then um, it sort of changed color. So it was literally a photographic plate with resolution greater than that of normal film and uh, you could expose it and get an image. So it's kind of like an E. coloroid, if you would call it that. <laughs> so anyway, if you don't know Drew, get to know him. He's great. Uh, ground floor of uh, Y2E2. So what is this new uh, era, this new sort of example of just, just groundbreaking change? If you're not in this domain it, and, and you get exposed to it the first time, it usually makes your jaw drop, especially the computer scientists, is that in a sense they're treating life uh, as software and building organisms from scratch and application cassettes that they would insert into these synthetic cells, synthetic chromosomes. And the cool thing is the software builds its own hardware, because these are living, reproducing organisms. And um, 
You can then also uh, use directed evolution, or basically evolution in a lab where you select the fastest growers by some criteria and do, in a sense, artificial evolution. You make a big advantage. Genomatica found much bigger advantages through artificial evolution than purposeful design. It's kind of poignant. And the applications, of course, are in some pretty big markets that are in dire need of change to get off the petrochemical economy. So let me give you concrete examples of um, how that business might work. First, as an abstract level, what would you do? You'd make these cells that make products from waste feedstocks or directly from CO2 in some of the most interesting cases. And, oh, by the way, it's catching the attention of a lot of people. This, I, I grabbed this um, frame grab from a video this morning. So Obama just gave the National Medal of Science to Craig Venter uh, earlier today. And um, about a couple of weeks, months ago, uh, ExxonMobil did a $600 million, um, well, between 300 and 600, depending on how you do the math, um, uh, investment. So 300 into synthetic genomics, 300 of other investment, co-investment, into algae-based um, fuels. And what they're doing is producing fuels you can run in your cars and jets directly from CO2 and water and sunlight. And they're getting them to excrete directly across the cell membrane. So you don't have to kill and harvest in batch mode the algae, but you just continuously secrete uh, across the cell membrane, which is an important advance on the separation cost of all that. And what are other things you can do with these microbes? Well, it turns out they, they naturally love to chew up coal. At least there's groups of, it, groups of them that do. Um, it naturally occurs, about 10% of our natural gas comes from this source, where deep underground microbes, anaerobic microbes, are chewing up coal, stripping electrons, and producing methane. So you can convert the dirtiest, most expensive to extract of the fossil fuels into the cleanest burning, easiest to extract. Uh, you burn natural gas at home without even a fume hood, so it it's, has almost no um, noxious uh, byproducts. So what do they want to do is understand you know, what, how these microbes work, how can we enhance it, how can we convert coal to natural gas without ever digging up the coal in the first place. And then when their first sample, they went down in the San Juan Basin, they drilled down into a pocket of water that was sitting under there and had been um, detached from the rest of the world for over 70, now estimates are about 100 million years, according to carbon dating. And there's an entire ecosystem of organisms living off each other, no sunlight, no exposure to air whatsoever, almost like a genetic time capsule from the past and, and remarkably efficient at what they do. So the business opportunity there is to, you know, understand what they eat, what catalysts might improve their performance, um, what consortia of these naturally occurring organisms, not genetically modified, because this could be a Kurt Vonnegut ICE-9 scenario if you made it too efficient. But uh, you want to, uh, uh, that's only for the science fiction buffs, you basically want to think about how uh, you could uh, enhance the way biology is doing what it already does naturally around the world. So what's another example? How can we get rid of the you know, multi-billion dollar fingers that hang off the petrochemical industry? It's kind of depressing that 90% of all of our organic chemicals, so your pampers, your, your, your toothbrushes, your plastics, they all, of course, come from oil. And right now they go through crackers, both catalytic and heat-generated processes. And ideally, we'd like to swap it for something where you use you know, like sugar, waste, CO2, things of that sort, and convert it into fuels and plastics. So let me just give you one example of that that's been worked on this year, and quite a bit of progress was made by a little company called Genomatica. It's in a niche called butane dial, you know, again, a multi-billion dollar market, but one of many. So you just one little specialty niche of the petrochemical industry. It's used to make spandex. So, you know, for those of you worrying about the future of spandex, it soon will be green, as well as a bunch of car body parts. But here's what's really cool about it. No organism on the planet makes butane dial, right? So there's no plant or animal that makes it, right? And so what the company did is they used the computational screening model to explore all possible pathways that could get you from sugar to that. And they explored 40,000 different pathways and figured out optimally, looking at the carbon utilization, what, does it, what do we think is going to be the best way to get the product we want from, from sugar? Then they um, engineered, purposeful design, if you will, a, um, a way to get from A to B through a series of intermediate steps, all within a single organism and within its metabolic process. But then they did something very clever. They crippled the organism's redundant pathways of survival. So the only way this organism can live and reproduce and have a life, nice long you know, life and produce children is if um, it makes more of the chemical you want as a byproduct. So all the other redundant pathways were knocked out with a bunch of gene knockouts so that in its own you know, ATP cycle of how it lives and how it harvests energy, it will make more of the chemical you want in, in so doing. What you then, the reason you do this is that rather than having your organism evolve away from what you want, you then just screen the fastest growers, picking off whoever's growing fastest, put them in a new bath, pick off the fastest growers, put them in a new vessel, and so on, and you get improvement way beyond human design. So they got about a 20-fold improvement of, you know, just using human smarts to go from the initial organism that did an okay job when they inserted the gene pathways to maybe a 20-fold improvement. And then in the last year, they've had a 20,000-fold improvement through artificial evolution. 
just saying we don't know how it's doing it. But if we just keep skimming the fastest growers, we're making more and more and more of the chemical we want. So it reminds me of something I read in a software book, the closing chapter of Danny Hillis's book, Pattern on the Stack. The greatest achievement of our technology may be the creation of tools that allow us to go beyond engineering, that allow us to create more than we can understand. And I think that's pretty profound in the software context, which I think in artificial intelligence, neural networks, and a variety of other areas, that's absolutely the future of, I think, how these systems we built. And I think it's the future of complex systems development in general, that the design engineered purposeful approach is gonna seed way to more of an out of control biologic process in both literal sense and in the metaphorical sense in how we build systems and software. So what might that mean in sort of driving towards some sort of closure on this point? An interesting intersection where what were formerly discrete domains of information science and life sciences are cross-pollinating in very interesting ways. Both the tools from one are being used in the other. The lessons learned in one are cross-pollinating to the other. How can we build a better neural network model when we're looking, of course, to better models of the brain itself? And so each of these fields is driving each other in a learning doing cycle. It's, it's quite remarkable. And it's applied in all kinds of random places you wouldn't imagine, like using a molecule similar to chlorophyll to make organic memory chips that you know, could compete with flash memory one day and uh, are you know, incredibly small, um, much, much smaller than anything we build today. And you just sort of splash and rinse as your manufacturing step instead of a you know, high energy physics process in, uh, in the current fabs today. And so there's some pretty interesting cross pollinations and breeding of these ideas um, across formerly discrete domains. So now I showed Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law and a couple other his sort of accelerating curve charts. And if anyone reads one of his books, you'll see page after page after page of these accelerating changes going on in technology. He had an interesting summary takeaway that you can sort of easily remember. And this is true in perpetuity, meaning it'll be true 20 years from now as it is today. But if you look forward 20 years to the future, you'll see as much technology advancement as the past 100. And that's pretty profound. If you think back to like 1909, anyone remember that? I, I don't, right? But in America, right, it, you, if you were born in the early 1900s, you were born at home without electricity, without, and not in a hospital, you probably didn't graduate high school. You know, society has changed dramatically in the last 100 years, largely driven by technology uh, and the vectors along education and social uh, equity. And to think that not as much change, certainly by no means, I mean, human nature is glacial and, and doesn't change uh, from year to year, but the drivers of comparable change, think about all the genomics revolutions, think about what's happened in the last 100 years with birth control, and then the next 100 years in genetically modified organisms, it's gonna be pretty, um, uh, how should I put it, a tension will arise between human nature and the pace of change. But I think some near-term implications are the forecast horizons are shorter and shorter. You know, predicting next quarter is going to be as difficult as predicting next year. And the idea of the 100-year business plan is as absurd as it ever was. And soon it'll be the one-year business plan will get more absurd. And that you have perpetual future shock. Everybody used to think, oh, it's that young generation that's using computers or whatever. And that's because the pace of change was going through a sort of generational 20-year gap. Soon it'll be, oh, you, you were the class of 90? Oh, shit. Yeah, everything's changed, right, in, in, in certain scientific disciplines. It certainly feels that way. And that, that idea that the future keeps changing faster than we can keep up with it, I think, will only accelerate. And that relates to things like Black Swan Events, a great book by Nicholas Taleb out of uh, Lebanon. I highly recommend it. Um, and he comes at it more from an econometric point of view or economist point of view that says, the future is increasingly driven by unpredicted events, things that in retrospect made sense, but at the time, no one predicted it. And as a venture firm, we try to take advantage of that, right? We try to invest in things that most people think are crazy ideas. It's kind of an interesting statement. And if we're, we don't strive for consensus when we invest in deals, we will allow a passionate minority to outweigh a blah majority, right? So a couple people that really want to do a deal can outvote like five that don't. And um, the reason is because no good idea that changes the world is universally regarded as one at its outset. So Google, Hotmail, Skype, Oh my gosh, the list goes on. eBay were generally laughed at by most venture capitalists when they were trying to raise their first round of capital. They were ridiculed. I know they were. Now, you won't get that opinion today. In retrospect, we all changed our story. We're like, oh yeah, I really tried to get that deal. I almost got that deal. I would have been in that deal. Um, it was brilliant. I was all over it. But at the time, they laughed at it. So you know, the ones, that, the companies that really do change the world, uh, and I would, this maybe is a sort of source of encouragement for the entrepreneurs with an idea. If everyone thinks your idea is good, it's probably not a big idea. If most people think your idea is bad, that's great, as long as you find somebody who thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> right? If 100% of people, and you've sampled widely, think it's a bad idea, it probably is a bad idea. <laughs> I, I don't know that one for you to be sure, but I, it might be a safe bet. But if you can find you know, like a 1 to 10 ratio, one person likes it, 10 hate it, that's perfect. As long as you respect the one person. I mean, if it's just a village idiot, I mean, <laughs> I like everything. Uh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
Okay. So uh, I don't know if I'll spend time on this, but there are all kinds of weird things. I mean, if you might think computing is done and you know, hardware is kind of on its trajectory, there are some weird experiments going on in the periphery of science with quantum computers that could change everything, where they literally engage parallel universes to compute in a way that is unlike any computing done today and could scale in ways that are unfathomable. Um, some of the physicists out of Oxford and elsewhere have predicted that on the curve that this company, D-Wave, is on, and, and, and there's arguments as to whether they're really a quantum computer, so let's put some caveats there. But if the quantum computers progress on a curve like some people are forecasting they might, that we'll soon have computers in the next 10 or 15 years that exceed the computational power of all classical computers ever built, and that could ever be built, if all the matter of the universe was converted into classical computers. <laughs> That's mind-bending. I'll just leave it at that. So, um, one or two more points before leaving on a completely different topic, but I just want to throw it out there in case the Q&A, someone wants to talk about, you know, the investment business instead of the entrepreneurial business. We've noticed this pattern, and it's not very well vetted, so if someone in the audience can shoot holes in this, I'd be very interested. But a weird pattern alternating between venture capital and private equity, meaning think about buyouts and mergers and these, you know, people that write really big checks, and then venture capital starting new businesses, punctuated by recessions that all seem to have these seven to ten year cycles. Um, and the only reason we like it is it would predict if history is any guide that we're now in a venture capital upswing. So it's a good fundraising slide. But other than that, I'm just not really sure why it's true other than long waves uh, and feedback loops that any dynamic system with a long path to feedback tends to oscillate. So like DRAM capacity planning, all these things tend to oscillate over the um, cycle time of feedback loops. And the feedback loops in venture capital and private equity are really slow. And so the seven to 10 year cycle kind of makes some sense as to when the inflows and outflows of capital occur in our business. But maybe we're on an, up, an uptick. What would it be? Well, here, you know, is the, you know, the mini computer, uh, you know, here, wait, let me get this right. No, sort of the mini computer, the person, no, wait. Where am I? Mini computer, personal computer, internet, you know, maybe energy, clean tech. Um, a lot of great companies were founded in down markets, great recessions, um, depressions. Um, a lot of great brands. People starting companies during these time periods tend to be passionate about what they're doing. They tend to focus on customers more than investors, like Hewlett Packard, focusing on Disney as an early customer. And they tend to build cultures that scale and that last. They aren't just out, again, on a money or land grab mentality. They're really building businesses the way you'd want to see them built. So we've generally found that some of the best companies, you know, the Microsoft, and I don't like Microsoft, but some of the long lasting companies like Microsoft and Hewlett Packard and such were started in down markets. So one, might, one of those upticks that we look for, I'm not going to spend time on this slide. I'll leave it for Q&A if anyone's interested, but it may be obvious to all that there's a lot of excitement around energy and clean tech not just because of public perception, geopolitical forces, and market sizes, and trillion dollar opportunities uh, instead of billion, which is what we usually look for. You have a lot of tech innovation, nanotech, biotech, infotech, all feeding into it. And most importantly, people like it, right? It's, you're cool again with your kids if you're working in this field, right? So management flocks to it, students flock to it all over the place. You feel good about what you do at work, and some of the best human talent and innovative ideas come from that human talent influx. And so if for no other reason than marketing, you're going to see a lot of advances in energy and clean tech. And we've been investing quite a bit in it, done about 40 investments here out of this office and 73 across the network. We started in energy generation, sort of in time, and also you can think about a sequence. Um, the smart grid, storage is really important right now, a lot of efficiency, and we're investing more and more on that end. Unusual things like agriculture, where you can double up the DNA in a plant, so having four parents instead of two, in a polyploidal organism, you, you get sort of the uber version of the plant, and uh, it's, it grows bigger, faster, stronger, and, and more disease resistant, less recessive genes are expressed. So that's kind of a fun one. And then a whole bunch of synthetic biology companies and water purification is an area that we're really excited about. So any of you that have breakthroughs in water purification, maybe coming out of left field, like, like I gotta imagine something going on in regenerative medicine building artificial kidneys and the membranes for an artificial kidney for dialysis would one day perhaps create a sustainable, um, maybe solar driven adaptive membrane for water purification. Something different than reverse osmosis, forward osmosis, distillation, the usual techniques. Okay, second to last slide. Um, basically, you know, what have I tried to convey? We're seeing more innovation than ever before. It's globalizing. And it's, it's great, the entrepreneurs are everywhere opening up human talent pool, removing a lot of the friction and barriers to good ideas, serving markets. And those customers, the flip side, are also everywhere. So you can tap into much bigger opportunities sooner as a startup. And these network effects are you know, mutually reinforced by the internet. So we think that all that rolls into an incredible renaissance of learning. So if you're a student of these subjects, it's a really exciting time to be in the lab, uh, especially in the synthetic biology area or the industrial biotech 2.0 area. And that this perpetual driver disruption technology in one way or another, it's a great cycle for entrepreneurs. And so when you think about starting companies, ask yourself, why couldn't 
why is it now that this business can exist and couldn't have existed 10 years ago? If there's not a good answer, it's probably not a great company to start. And is there something about technology trends that makes it better and better as time goes on? And we think bottom line, it's a great time to build new companies. So with that, let me switch to Q&A, uh, if I may. And I'm happy to talk about anything I spoke about here or anything completely unrelated. Steve? Yes? We're going to uh, switch on. Of course, to do the first question and open up the general Q&A. Oh, sorry. Is that right? okay. Yeah, absolutely. Hold on one second. Of course. Hello, my name is uh, Tom Haymore. I'm subbing in for uh, Steve Blank. I'm not sure this is actually working. Yeah, just speak up. All right, so I'm subbing in for Steve Blank on the MSNE 278 course, which wraps around this, and we kind of discuss the companies and the people that come. and. We we'll actually have the great pleasure of having Steve join us for a few minutes after this lecture as a plug for those of you thinking about the class in the winter. <laughs> we wanted to, I wanted to jump in here with an entrepreneurship focused question and ask, what do you see as the most common mistakes that entrepreneurs make? We saw some of what you think the great characteristics are. What do you see as some of the common failures, the common critical mistakes? Hmm. There's a lot of different mistakes. Let me think, uh, think what's common. So one of the, um, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of, do I want to filter for the common mistakes we see in our portfolio? That's already passed through a filter of we decided to invest in it, and so there's a sample selection bias up to that. Um, you know, did we induce the problems, uh, or, uh, or do we have a weird filter in what we look for? Um, let me start in a roundabout way and see if I can get to an answer if I start percolating on something. The first thing that jumped to mind had to do with people. Because there's huge diversity in markets, and, and I'm not sure if there's a generalizable lesson across all industries as to, you know, here's how you want to think about your business. But when it comes to human dynamics, they tend to be um, the same across all companies. And oftentimes, there can be a, um, a sort of a control problem with the founding DNA of a firm. So I've noticed that a lot of great firms tend to have a pair of founders as a minimal, minimally sufficient set. Uh, the Jobs and the Wozniak, the Sabir and Jack at, at Hotmail, you know, there, there's a dynamic duo almost everywhere. And even some of the companies that have a very strong cult of personality like Larry Ellison, there was Bob Miner, you know, behind him and Paul Allen to Bill Gates. Um, and I wonder if there's something about the best firms in having a marketing skill set and an engineering skill set, not having a single person that shares both of those in the extreme. And that if there's sort of a mutual respect in the founding team that says, you know, you do what you do well and I do what I do well, and from the very beginning we've bifurcated responsibilities and roles, then that tends to scale better versus the cult of the CEO that says, you know, I'm in charge, this is my company, and everyone I hire works for me, and I kind of know how everything works. That doesn't scale as well. Um, and so one of the classic, you know, these scaling mistakes occurs when a company reaches the point where it has more employees than the average tribe evolutionarily did. And you don't know the name of everyone in your firm everywhere anymore. And then all kinds of managerial, you know, headaches uh, ensue. So coming back to the founding uh, in the early days, I think, you know, it's an old adage that, you know, A managers hire A plus teams, you know, and a B manager hires a C team. That may have been a, a, a euphemism you've heard before. But th it's real tr really true that if you don't have enough self-confidence to be humble, and you're too much of an egotist, you're going to, you know, feel threatened by people who challenge your authority, and you won't necessarily hire the best and brightest of what they do, and the whole thing just sort of doesn't work as well. So we try to find entrepreneurs who have that humility to like, expose their concerns, you know, and say, here's what we think we got it nailed, but here's what we really don't need, know it, the answers, and we need help. Um, there's all kinds of other mistakes. Um, you know, in, in shifting market trends, the classic example, of course, is just, you know, can you forecast well enough and see the pattern on the wall of when you need to downshift or, or, or upshift your business growth? Um, there are a lot of businesses that have stumbled unnecessarily because they, they sort of didn't have the, the, the gyro of their business set right to the, to the, to the pace of, uh, of customer action. The other, um, I guess, related point that I was alluded to in down markets is, you know, it's really important not to mistake customers for investors. Um, or vice versa, I think your investor is your customer. Um, if you can, especially in down markets, find a customer to finance your growth, it's going to be a much healthier way to grow your business than continually going back to you know, outside sources of capital. Uh, some businesses need it more than others, but in the energy clean tech space, there are some that are you know, really capital intensive on the front end long before they have any feedback from the market. So you know, what we love to see is fast feedback cycles. Product release cycles, you know, software as a service, that was one of the big advantages of it. Um, and in a lot of other areas, if, if you don't sort of have to build it and then hope it's successful, it's going to be a much better way to build a business. And so to the extent you can architect or pivot, when do you actually start interfacing with customers? 
Uh, it's one of the reasons games is such a bad business to invest in. You don't know if it's good until you've really polished the product to know if the gameplay is compelling. Uh, you know, a mock-up usually doesn't do the trick. So um, there's certain sectors we don't invest in because of that feedback cycle. I, I can go on, I'll, maybe I'll come back to it if I can think of a better answer later. <laughs> sure, okay, sure. Um, what was your favorite class at Stanford? <laughs> mm. Repeat the question. What was my favorite class at Stanford? Which uh, undergrad, uh, I did Anything. three. Gosh, the one that jumps to mind is touchy-feely, uh, as it's affectionately called. That's a business school where you, you do uh, psychotherapy, group therapy, basically, masquerading as a class. Um, and as an engineer, that was the most in, uh, sort of enlightening of how detached I was from my emotions and how, uh, uh, how other people who had different thinking styles weren't really freaks, but just really had different thinking styles. And that was eye-opening for me, having you know, gone through much of my life with a different set of views. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm saying that somewhat jokingly, but I honestly did think that, you know, the pessimist is just, you know, kind of a, you know, just a, a, a bizarre life form, you know, and why would you ever work with a pessimist? Um, uh, things like that. So, th but uh, there were a lot. When I was an undergrad, I really liked all the classes I took outside my major. So I remember Professor Romo Hart's class on neural networks in the psychology department, and I tried whatever I could do to get as many classes outside my major, which was electrical engineering, um, as I could. And those are the ones I remember much much more. The only things I really remember from EE classes were some of the professors and students I met uh, and some of the projects, but not like, oh yeah, uh, EE 102, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> that was a great one. Um, uh, does that help? Yeah. Cool. Yeah? What made you decide to stop being an engineer and become a venture capitalist? Is it more fun? Well, yeah, <laughs> for certain personality types, for the like short attention span crowd um, and the ADD folks. Oh, sorry, when did I decide? to shift from engineering to venture capital and is it more fun? Was that the reason? Um, so the, the, the trajectory of my career was somewhat of a random walk of, of sort of successive exposures. So uh, when I was at EE, I was working at Hewlett Packard in the seed program doing work study, work study. I went over a long period of summers doing chip design at Hewlett Packard and thought I wanted to be an engineering manager because it, within that framework and that cocoon of sort of promote from within and lifetime employment, which was espoused at the time, it was a long 20 year cycle. You become an engineering manager. It seemed like they had a lot more influence on the world than, than the engineers whose products might be canceled at any given moment. And I just, it was very naive. I was very, knew nothing about business. Um, and I thought, well, gosh, how could I you know, accelerate that 20 year path? And so I thought, I gotta somehow find a way to get to business school and as an engineering, that was the only sort of career planning that I had in my life. Um, how can I get to business school? Because that could be a segue somehow to being an engineering manager. And so when I was leaving, I was starting a PhD program here in EE, but didn't uh, complete it. Uh, I was about two quarters into it. Um, I shifted gears entirely and went to a management consulting firm, Bain & Company. It's a firm that my dad had exposure to, and I never knew anything about consulting firms. And they must have thought I was remarkably naive and charming when I interviewed, and I didn't even know who the biggest company in the firm was, McKinsey, you know, in the industry. Had never thought of applying there. Um, and I only applied to Bain because that's the only one I knew of. Um, and so I worked there for three and a half years, but that worked out really in an interesting and fortuitous way. I was working across a variety of different high-tech clients. I expressed the desire to only work on high-tech companies, and I saw all kinds of patterns, you know, almost like case studies, as we do in business school, of vignettes of, let's say, a merger and acquisition situation, or a new product uh, introduction, or a company going under, or you name it, um, usually brought in by the CEO as a special ops team to sort of work on some crisis du jour or opportunity du jour. And that did, the one thing that worked according to plan was that did get me into business school. Um, so that went according to plan, but then it was a random walk. I thought in business school by that point, I was thinking maybe product marketing would be what I want to do. I, I started to get the sense I didn't really want to go back to engineering quite the same way. And so I worked on my summer jobs at business school at um, Apple and Next. I wanted to see Steve Jobs in action as a childhood hero of mine. And, um, and that was a trip. Um, and, and, and I wasn't really sure that was for me either. I wasn't entirely sure. And it was a big economic incentive to go back to Bain because they were going to pay for all the business school. Uh, in fact, they did. And I owed them all the money back if I didn't go back to Bain. So that was sort of the default. And I was cruising into my second year of business school, and then I got a call out of nowhere from a venture capitalist from Greylock, uh, a friend, a former Bain um, colleague of mine who said, we're coming out to the West Coast and interviewing. Would you like to interview? And I was like, okay. And, and then I did a, just a dive. I spoke to every student. They were the most helpful. And professors. They were also quite helpful. They knew anything about venture capital. This was before the internet really percolated through any of those industries. There was no way to literally learn about what the venture industry was and the difference between the firms. But I just did a deep dive of interviews, to, and they were informational to start because I just kept getting turned down, again, because I didn't know what I was doing. And to make a long story short, I, um, 
finally found a group who was called Draper Associates at the time that was very unlike the others. It was a, much more of a playful camaraderie and almost uh, um, uh, tracing to the founder's personality. Um, a, a very uh, different feel from the white shoe conservative model that I'd seen so many other places. And so I did join there and, and, and um, the, at the time, before I joined, I thought, okay, I love technology. From the consulting gig, I like diversity more than depth. I like to learn throughout my life, and then somehow my brain just clicks more on learning horizontally than being the master of something uh, in, in great detail. And so that has played out in that we're even more finely cut, in a way, than at the consulting firms in terms of you know, time slices of attention and, and what we focus on. But we can stay on the frontiers of the unknown, and, and, and with the entrepreneurs we invest in, try to find those ideas that are really at the cutting edge. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so that's fun, because so it, um, it, it just really makes it fascinating. Yeah, and I don't think of myself as a banker. When I was in business school, uh, I don't think I took any accounting or economics or finance classes. That whole thing bores me to tears. I don't use Excel at work. I mean, I love Excel. I do my expense reports, or, um, my taxes in Excel. So I use it, but I have no use, use for it at work. Um, so just get a sense of very different kind of work than banking or other types of finance, uh, making intuitive judgments on markets and people. Cool. And that, is that good? Okay. Sure. I saw a hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What kind of profile do you look for uh, when hiring a venture associate? Into our firm? Yeah. So the question is, what do we look for <laughs> profile-wise when we're hiring someone at our firm? <laughs> Let's see. I, was, I can give you a specific answer for a firm, but then also try to generalize a bit to firms because there's a lot of good venture firms and, and they vary. Um, we look for, you know, smart, f flexibly minded people that are different from others we've hired. So we try to diversify our skill sets and backgrounds. We look for people who have, you know, a deep Rolodex of contacts and such, but we also look for that, that self-confidence to be humble point I was making with regard to entrepreneurs. That we do look for that in the people we hire as well, because it, even though there can be a lot of big egos floating around in this industry, it, it could be a, a barrier to learning, I think, if you think you have the answers, you come in with the game plan as opposed to a spirit of lifelong learning, uh, frankly. So um, I think, there, but I want to give a caveat, and, and this, this caveat will apply to all, all firms, including ourselves. Um, whenever you ask that question of anyone in the venture business, but maybe in any business, um, <laughs> notoriously in the venture business. You'll hear an answer that sounds remarkably like the person speaking. And, and the people who really don't have good self-awareness will say, and that's what you have to have, and that's the only way to be a successful venture capitalist. So I can't tell you how many times when I was getting into the, you know, interviewing and getting into this field, I'd hear these definitive statements like, if you haven't been an entrepreneur, how could you be a VC? Or if you haven't had 10 years of operating experience, how could you be a VC? And, and, those, and other contradictory statements would be made by partners in the same firm, um, which was remarkable. And then um, I might point out in my cover letter, we'll notice that the people who are like the most senior partners at Excel and Benchmark and Oak, and I give this long list, haven't had more than a summer job of operating experience in their life. You know, how do you factor that in? So, you know, th there's no answer. I never got a call back from any of those firms. Um, so the only traction I got were people who were themselves consultants, because that was my biggest, you know, member of consulting, business school, VC. That was the thing on the top of my resume stack. You know, those are the only people that's paying attention to me. So that homophily bias, as it's called, in recruiting is very strong amongst firms that have no processes, no HR department, and are, you know, managerially a mess, like every venture firm. So, so therefore, you know, your best bet is find someone like yourself, that, you know, on the web that you can you send a letter into. Um, but there is variety. You have people that come from the rec uh, recruiting backgrounds, legal backgrounds, although, God, those are the most annoying. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh, it's all over the map. Engineer. Marketeers, uh, there tend to be a ton that have come from Stanford or Harvard Business School. So there is an overt, I think, bias. And you know, I don't know that it's so much the simplicity of saying, oh, that's you know, where we hire from. It's just there's no HR department or process. So imagine a firm said, hey, send resumes. It'd be overwhelming. Who's going to read the resumes? So what do venture firms do? They're like, tell everybody you're not hiring. And then you know, when you do want to hire someone, say, do you know anyone? And, and literally hire someone that's a friend of somebody who's already at the firm. So like, almost everyone in our firm pivoted off of somebody else that we knew, right? And that was one of the few exceptions. My resume was over the transom. And the only other exception was Jennifer Fonstead, who came through this program called the Kaufman Program, which is a great way to get into. And they purposefully focused on breaking down this, this in hiring bias, where if you only hire it from your friends, those networks tend to be pretty insular. And how can we get more diversity in the, in the venture business? And looping back, we believe as a firm that's essential. If you want to um, get the wisdom of crowds and not have groupthink in a partnership dynamic, you want as much diversity in the ideas coming in as possible. Um, and so we try, to, we try to do that, but it's hard when you don't have an HR department. Cool. The back row. Kevin, 
did you compare your role as a venture capitalist to that of a serial entrepreneur? So somebody who's starting mm -hmm. a venture company. Yeah, what, what do you mean by how would I compare it? Like what's well, sim it, how similar? How involved do you feel uh, as a venture capitalist you are in, in the companies that you, you help build ah. rather than the entrepreneur with the idea and then building a team? Gotcha. So the question was, how would I compare or contrast the venture job to a serial entrepreneur and the, the degree of involvement in particular? Okay, very different. And, and I think any venture capitalist who thinks they're similar is either going to be very unhappy as a venture capitalist or very painful to the companies they invest in. Because it is not an operating job. Right? Being on the board of a startup, at best you're a mentor, coach, and cheerleader. Right? You are not calling the shots. You are not saying what the business should do. You're not in control. You live vicariously through the successes of your portfolio of investments, and you can cheer them on, but at the end of the day, the entrepreneurs deserve all the credit for building their business. And those few uh, VCs, rather, those few VCs that confuse that point tend to come from the deep operating backgrounds. Right? Some, some of the best ones don't, but there are a few that sort of burn out in this industry pretty quickly and are very frustrated in their having transitioned just from a, you know, 10 years of operating experience into board member role and realizing it's very different. Um, so, uh, EIR, for those who don't know, entrepreneur in residence uh, or serial entrepreneur are people who um, sort of are in the, in the sort of habit of starting one business after another. So they not, may not be as committed to any one business they start, they tend to start a lot of them. Um, and so perhaps driving the question was, well, maybe that's kind of similar to being a VC, but I think it's actually very different. Because if you're in the trenches, you know, you're really responsible for the product, the service, launching it, everything. It's a very different kind of feel. Cool. Yeah. One more? Okay. Uh, sure. um, so you had a really interesting point where you said a small group of really passionate people can overturn the rest of the investors. So how do you sort of define that? And can you talk a little bit about that? What processes do you have in place to make sure that happens? Yeah. Hmm. It's the only question I'm a little hesitant to because it's something we're kind of, like if we had any trade secret, that's kind of it. Um, <laughs> Like in offsites, we spend most of our time talking about our voting processes. And when we made a small change, like, does it take, like, we thought, for example, that it. Just move? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Um, this is a local dead spot. Um, that if we had three partners that would all had to be in support of a deal and would vote a five on a one to five scale where you can't vote a three, so you have to make a decision which way you're leaning. Strongly supportive, strongly opposed, mildly supportive, mildly um, opposed. Uh, if you had to have three fives and oh, why any one of those three be willing as a pre-qualifier to getting a deal done, we thought that would generate a very interesting dynamic of the way the conversations go, how you schedule meetings, the pace at which we could invest, and we thought it would accelerate things. It actually slowed the pace of investment down dramatically versus f having five partners see a deal and for a variety of reasons. So as a preamble, we've tweaked so many different things. The, the, the short version is what we found most successful is, you know, everyone gets a vote, and they're all equal votes, of course. You have to vote at the exact same time. So the key for not having groupthink is you can't have you know, one strong voice say, I'm a five, and then other people vote. It's like, okay, one, two, three, everyone show your hand at the same time so that you expose minority opinions more easily. Um, so there isn't any of that kind of overt pressure, even though, generally speaking, we don't respond much to that overt pressure. We all laugh at each other more than toe the line. Nevertheless, uh, you know, it's an important parameter. If you didn't do that, everything would fall apart. And, um, and what we do is a simple voting tally, so what, you know, how, you know, how many fives are there and, you know, a bunch of, it can outweigh a bunch of twos um, if you just add it up and take the average. So um, that's generally how we do it. We've experimented with other things. We've added the bullet, as it's called, meaning every partner can get a deal done with remarkably low friction as long as it's a small amount of money um, in each fund as a patch um, at various points when we felt like something was a lot of balance. Um, but the th interesting thing is these simple rules, I think, are really important in business. And you think about starting a startup or working in a large company, the way you set up the processes and architect the way communication occurs can dictate, I think, a lot of the emergent properties of the firm. Does it operate like a hive or does it operate like a bunch of warning individuals? Can you tap into the wisdom of crowds or not? Can you, um, uh, in a sense, uh, build a business that's greater than the sum of its parts? And I think at Google, Gore and a bunch of other firms, you found that they'll break up teams when they're more than five or seven people. Right, and a development team, if you have more than five or seven programmers working on something, phew, forget it. Board of directors, never more than seven people if we can help it. There's a, there's a critical size-driven efficiency to emergent properties of firms that I think is really important in decision making. Uh, and how you orchestrate that or architect that can have more impact than how you manage as a leader. Saying, we're going to go north. We're going to take that market. More important could be, you know, how do you what's your voting policy? Hence the, hence the importance of your question. Thanks.
Well, thank you. I think that's it, right? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, on behalf of Basis, STVP, and Draper Fisher, <laughs> we'd like to thank Steve for coming to speak for us. And here's an award um, from the ETL team. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank, thank you, Steve. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.